Welcome back to the March for Unity, Civility, and Political Engagement. My name is Simi Hundle, and we are in the sixth episode of the 22-2022 season today on September 11th. As we take in this heavy day in America, my heart and prayers go out to the victims of the tax 21 years ago. My mind reflects on how we can prevent such a tragedy in the future. I believe it entails recognizing that we are not an island in America, but a part of an international community. And with that, our theme today is an international one, US-China relations. Let's begin with a quote from a former US president. I always have believed that the most important bilateral relationship in the world is between the United States and China. It is very important for our two countries in the world to maintain that relationship with mutual respect. We have different histories, different cultures, different ideas, and different political systems, but those differences should be accommodated by the presidents of the US and by the leaders of China, maintaining mutual respect and proper understanding between us. Mm -hmm. Sharing important responsibilities is still absolutely critical, excuse me, crucial for our two countries and for the world." End quote. This quote was taken from the beginning of Jimmy Carter's speech, February 14th, February 14th, 2018, mm -hmm. I challenge Americans tuning in to try to learn the nuances and history of our country's histories. I have the pleasure to learn from our guests that are on an island that has been recently at the center of the tension between the two superpowers, Taiwan. Dr. Keating, could you please introduce yourself? Okay, Jimmy, uh, I'm Jerome Keating. I've been in Taiwan since 1988. I came here as manager of technology transfer, building the Taipei Mass Rapid Transit, did the same thing in Kaohsiung, and then got married to a Taiwanese, became an associate professor and retired from National Taipei University. I've written five books on Taiwan, three, which, three of which have been translated into Chinese. I'm very pro-democracy and very pro-Taiwan. Thank you, Dr. Keating. Great to have you on. Donovan, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I've been here for uh, basically the same amount of time as, as Jerome has. Um, and uh, But I didn't come here with a, a job. I was just sort of a wandering young person. Um, and um, uh, basically right now what I do is um, I do a, a wear a variety of hats. I'm a co-publisher of a city guide magazine here in Taichung. Uh, I do the Central Taiwan News on national radio for ICRT. Um, and I also do political uh, analysis and foreign policy analysis for the Taiwan News, a, a local news outlet. Uh, among many other things, including organizing uh, rock festivals and things like that. Um, um, so uh, so basically, I've got kind of a grab bag of different hats that, that I wear. But uh, primarily, I think right now, I'm probably best known for uh, political and foreign policy analysis. Great. Thank you, Donovan. Great to have both of your perspectives, especially given how plugged in you are to Taiwan. Dr. Keating, I would like to start with you. Let me go ahead and jump right into the program. Our first question is um, uh, related to the tensions between the US and China. Tensions between the two countries are dangerously high. Some have described US-China relations as a ticking time bomb. A few points to keep in mind. The chance of a military accident seems high given the lack of coordination between the sides. China is severely provoked with a visit by U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi in August. The U.S. State Department has recently approved a $1.1 billion Taiwan arms sale this month, representing the largest military sale to Taiwan during the Biden administration. China views democratically governed Taiwan as its own territory, despite the objections of the government in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. Couple of questions for you. One is what should each of these parties, meaning the US, China, and Taiwan do? And the second question is what can be done to avoid war? Okay, well, that, that's a, a big question. What should each one do? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm actually 
going to probably start with China, mainly because China won't listen to me anyway. But <laughs> I, uh, I'll go back. In my perspective, China has no legitimate claim to Taiwan. I can go into that. I've got a piece that'll probably be coming out in the Taipei Times in the next couple of days explaining that on how it works on a myth and uh, also fosters its true believers. But uh, China, you know, it's a big country. It's got a good economy. It should run, focus on running its country. There is no outside threat to China. No one is going to attack a country that big, just like you don't attack Russia. You know, your supply lines get totally exhausted. But uh, they seem to operate from this, well, I'm gonna be very critical in a sense, but they, they want to dominate Asia. That's understandable perhaps, but I don't think they need to. They, with their big economy, et cetera, they don't need to be a militarily dominant force. Uh, so that's one part. Uh, they should lay off in my mind, but as I say, they're, they're not going to listen to me. They are hegemonic in my perspective. Now, Taiwan, let's go to Taiwan. Taiwan should defend itself. It's a de facto independent country. Uh, it should accept all the arms it can from the US. It should continue to foster its democracy. It should continue to promote its own self identity. And then the US. The US has always been, in a way, a problem here. Now, why do I say that? Well, when you look at the end of World War II, okay? Now, the end of World War II ends in 1945, before you were born, Jimmy. But uh, uh, I was there. I'm not, not at the end of the war, but I was living then. But the World War II ends, the San Francisco Peace Treaty comes seven years later, Japan surrenders sovereignty over Taiwan, and the US, which is the chief victor in the war, in a way creates the problem because it partially doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know how to handle. China has had its civil war. It's a complex situation. No one wants to go back into war again. But the uh, official US position right now on Taiwan is seven is undecided. Now, we're 77 years after the end of World War Two. In my mind, that's a friggin long time to be undecided. And the US, you know, always says, to Taiwan, don't rock the boat, don't rock the boat. They did this to Li Dong Wei, they did it to Chen Shui Bian, uh, they did it to you know, almost every president. <laughs> and yet, you know, and they say, we'll sell you arms, but don't rock the boat. We don't want to give you the best arms, don't rock the boat. Uh, and then, you know, don't count on us completely, but don't rock the boat also. The US has played what they call strategic ambiguity, but strategic ambiguity has two sides. China then can play it their way and say, if you say independence, we'll attack. You know, they can play the game the, their way as well. So uh, that's my starter on it. I'll let Courtney come in, <laughs> unless you want more clarification there. I'd, I'd say sure. go ahead, Jerome. <clears throat> I guess um, uh, a follow-up question to clarify, Dr. Keating, is the the response that you have there. 
is there particular highlights that you would point to regarding these parties regarding avoiding war or um, uh, is it really just a matter of principle at this point these are the things that should be done by each of the parties regardless of whether war will occur or not okay want me to continue or, or... yes yeah okay. in particular regarding uh, avoiding war. well you know obviously taiwan doesn't want war taiwan is the smallest factor here you know only 23 million against you know all those in china so Taiwan is not promoting war. The only one that is really threatening war is China. And it is threatening for its hegemonic claims. That's my basic position. I don't see anyone in Taiwan that is pro-war. Uh, they are pro-democracy. They are pro-identity, et cetera. The US obviously is not pro-war. They don't want to get into a war with China over, you know, over Taiwan and even over Japan, which they have a treaty with to protect. So I don't think they want war, but China is using that as a threat. And so in my mind, the really the only one that is promoting war or threatening war is China. The uh, so you know, uh, that's what it's going to come down to. The uh, China has a hegemonic ambition, Taiwan is very geopolitically well positioned, it gives it blue water access, it controls the south and east China seas. You know, Taiwan is a jewel to control. So it's obviously why China would want it. But in my mind, if they would run their country peacefully, they don't need it. Donovan, I want to turn to you and give you a chance to respond to that question. Um, what can be done to avoid war? Do you, are there certain things that come to mind for you? Um, well, let me just uh, quickly add a small clarification to something that Jerome said before. I'm just adding some detail. Uh, he was talking about how the U.S. position on Taiwan has remained for over 70 years, uh, has remained, un that Taiwan's international status is undetermined. Um, to clarify that a little bit is after the end of World War II, if, if you remember that, for example, Germany was partitioned into four parts. And the made allied powers occupied each one of those four zones. Japan also was occupied in a similar manner with the United States primarily uh, uh, occupying the, Jap the Japan home islands. And the primary occupying force representing the allies uh, for the, uh, the, the Japanese colony of Taiwan, which they'd had for 50 years at that point. Uh, was the Republic of China. And then there was the civil war in China. The government in China uh, collapsed, and basically they decamped uh, with their government in exile to Taiwan. And then, of course, as, as Jerome mentioned, then there was the Treaty of San Francisco, which handed over, uh, which where they renounced sovereignty over Taiwan, but it didn't specify to whom. And so Legally, the U.S.'s position and that of many other countries, uh, including Japan, the U.K., Canada, is that Taiwan's international status is undetermined. Um, so I just wanted to add some more detail uh, to give you a little bit of that sort of gap period there. Um, um, so I'm sorry, the question was, what can be done to avoid war? I think it was. Correct. Yes. Um, well, what can be done to avoid war? I, the problem is, is I, I think, and again, I think I'm really just echo, echoing Jerome here, um, is really the all of the impetus for a potential war is coming from the Chinese side. And there's not a whole lot we can do to change Xi Jinping's mind other than to increase deterrence and make it more expensive and difficult for China to attack Taiwan. 
Um, and so as Jerome was noting, um, I, Taiwan really, I think, needs to continue uh, building up its military uh, capabilities. Um, I think there needs to be, and there's some movement on this, I think not enough in my opinion, um, a mobilization of reserve forces. Um, I think that people here need to get a little bit more into a, a, a threat, a sense of threat kind of mentality. Um, and in other words, prepare. I also think that there needs to be better coordination all starting to happen uh, between the United States and Japan uh, and Australia uh, over Taiwan. Uh, they've already explicitly said their militaries are discussing contingencies in the situation. Um, a U.S., a stronger U.S. presence physically in Taiwan uh, might be a good idea. They generally have about 30 trainers here, and that's about it. Um, but the problem is, if a war does actually break out, there needs to be interoperability interoper between Taiwan's forces and uh, American forces. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, there's a bill in Congress which the Biden administration is trying to tinker with. But one of the provisions of this, and it's a bipartisan um, uh, bill, by the way, um, sponsored by both Democrats and Republicans and supported by large members of both parties. And one of the, one of the elements is that Taiwan would th be considered by the United States as a non-NATO ally, which would mean that uh, the flow of arms and uh, the approval process for weaponry, and importantly, also interop interoperable uh, uh, munitions and armaments would then get into Taiwan's hands easier. And hopefully that would come with trainers. There's also some um, uh, funding involved as well, um, and a, a number of other things. But on the, on the defense side, there's that. Um, I think a, a lot of the responsibility, though, does fall on the Taiwan side. And while the military budget has been increased, it's still the regular defense budget, excluding special armaments budgets, is only 2.4% of GDP, which is too low and lower than the 3% that President Tsai campaigned on uh, back in 2016. Lots of follow-up questions that come to mind for, for the response, but I'm gonna stick a pin in that in case we have time later on. Donovan, I wanna to move to uh, a more broad question regarding US and China for you. These world powers have accumulated numerous adversaries over the years. How is their foreign policy towards adversaries similar and how is it different? Well, um... Sorry about the sirens going off in the background there. Um, it adds ambiance to discussion of war, I suppose. <laughs> Especially this discussion, it's true. Um, I mean, the U.S. and China do have some similarities. They're, you know, they're both massive powers um, and can be, uh, they can be a, a aggressive, arrogant, um, Certainly both uh, have tendency to, to get involved in things militarily. Um, and the, so the, there's some similarities there. Um, and both of them, of course, have massive economic uh, and, and uh, have massive economic influence um, around the world. And so that gives them both a lot of heft. I think the the major difference between the two is that the U.S., at least in more, more recent history, um, I'm talking post-World War II, has largely allowed itself to be constrained and helped build the current international order. Now, it has more influence than a lot of other countries in it, but it still allows itself to be constrained by a lot of international agreements and by and large follows the rules. Um, and generally speaking, with the occasional exception, uh, respects sovereignty of other countries. Now, 
And also the United States has a lot of friends and allies around the world. China has no friends and no allies. Um, and this has a lot to do with the way China views itself. And there's two reasons for this. One is, uh, one is that historically, the way China viewed the world is there are tributary nations which accepted the Chinese emperor as higher to them, and these countries would offer tributes to the Chinese emperor. And that was one of the ways that they kept the Chinese from outright conquering them. Because for most of its history, China has been an empire, and it still is today, uh, including East Turkestan and Tibet and Inner Mongolia and, uh, and uh, Manchuria could be argued as well. Um, and so you'll notice that within uh, China's sphere of influence are countries like Laos, um, North Korea, Cambodia, uh, Mongolia itself. Um, and these countries are essentially heavily influenced by China. Um, there's not a whole lot. They don't have a whole lot of independence. If China snaps its fingers, they're pretty much going to do what China says. Um, and the other thing is, is it also comes out of the Marxist background and the United Front. And China has in its Chinese Communist Party constitution and in the People's Republic of China constitution, uh, recently included language that essentially says, we want to dominate the world and create a new world order. And what they want to do is do this in their mold where they are at the center of it and they make all the rules. And so they have United Front operations infiltrating countries all around the world, trying to, for example, subvert democracies, pay off politicians, um, and to spread their message to try and undermine the existing world order. They've infiltrated organizations to a heavy degree with a, with a very pointed goal of subverting. These include WHO, um, the United Nations, and they've done so with a varying degree of success. Um, obviously, the UN did finally come out with its human rights report on uh, Xinjiang. China only managed to get it watered down. They failed to have it completely spiked. They tried. Um, but on the other hand, they frequently get the UN to do things like change uh, junior high school's website uh, because of the way that Taiwan was mentioned and some of the students at the junior high school, and this is in Colorado, if memory serves, they wanted to participate in some junior UN activity. Um, but the they are so intensely focused on this dominance that they will interfere with a junior high school website. Um, they will interfere with, uh, there was a case I mean, it gets so ridiculously petty, but there was a case where in uh, Australia, there were these paper mache cows or ceramic cow statues, and all the kids from different countries were asked to, to paint their flags on it from, you know, where their ancestors were from. And of course, the Chinese found out about this and demanded that the school paint over the Taiwan flag. Um, I mean, it, it's that petty and that focused and that intense. Um, and they keep very, very careful score of how many people they have in various organizations and how much influence they have. And parallel to that, they're creating a whole series of new organizations like, you know, and entities. Uh, there's a whole slew of them. Um, and they all have one thing in common. Um, and this is something that uh, Dr. Sadia Rahman just wrote a nice uh, paper on the other day, um, is that they have uh, at their core an asymmetry of power, where China is the dominant force within all of these new organizations. 
whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative or the Shanghai Security uh, uh, the Arrangement or any, any of them, but it, they're built specifically around building a new world order outside of the ones where multiple countries have multiple voices. And this is in direct contrast to China's propaganda. Now, the US does have outsized influence. It's usually the biggest funder of these organizations and the most powerful country. But at the end of the day, it usually respects their norms. So for example, in NATO over the last, and this is to use a very current example, for uh, decades now, US presidents have been berating the other NATO countries to live up to their commitment to spend 2% of GDP on military spending. And virtually none of them have done so and basically just ignored the United States. The US also was trying to pressure them to not be so reliant on Russian supplies of gas and oil. And they ignored the United States. So the United States does have an outsized influence like China does, but they tend to follow rules and they tend to back down once it gets to a certain point. Um, obviously leaving examples like Afghanistan and Iraq out of the question. Um, uh, but generally speaking, they, they will try to use a, a carrot approach um, and occasionally a stick approach, but it's usually economic rather than, um, and they don't infiltrate other countries. So in other words, and also in a lot of cases, when you see the United States kind of throw its weight around and try and bully other countries, it's usually on a case by case, instance by instance thing to do with specific national interests. Unlike China, which has a blanket worldwide approach to subversion. In the US, it'll be much more like bullying Canada over lumber imports, you know, that kind of thing, where it's a very narrow interest. It's usually that kind of thing, you know, trade issues and that sort of thing. Sure. Um, let's move on to the rapid fire portion of the program. Uh, here, we're going to have opinionated statements that will be presented and the panelists will either agree or disagree, or maybe partially agree or partially disagree. <laughs> if there's a difference of opinions, then a short discussion will clarify the reasoning for the stances, again, to both uh, the panelists as well as the audience. Um, this is not a black or white um, type statements that will be made. These often are gray areas with um, very much degrees of which um, people believe that that statement is true or are true based off of a dependency. So please give grace and um, uh, benefit of the doubt to the panelists of whom I'm asking to respond with just one word. With that, I will start with trade and economy, uh, that, that section. Over recent decades, the number one reason for China's rise as a superpower is their investment in education. Dr. Keating, do you agree or disagree? I don't agree with that. The, I think there's a lot of other factors that, uh, that in, imply, you know, interaction with other countries. Donovan, agree or disagree? Uh, I, I, I largely or partially disagree with it. Pretty much the same answer as Jerome. Right. Moving on to the second one. Chris Patton, the last British governor of Hong Kong, reckons China has been the globe's top economy for 18 of the past 20 centuries. China will again be the top economy for the majority of the 21st century. Dr. Keating. Well, I... I agree. When you got a country that size, it's always going to be a big economy. But I, I don't quite agree with Patton's reasoning on that 18 of 20 years or 20 years, whatever it is, he said. No, so I, I don't quite agree with him. Okay. Donovan? I disagree. Um, so just to clarify, Donovan, you do not believe that China will be the top economy for the majority of the 21st century. Could you expand on that, please? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible for a portion of, of the of the 21st century, it might. Um, now, originally, or at most estimates had that it was going to be the, the world's biggest economy sometime in the middle of this decade. Um, but a lot of uh, economic problems in China have pushed that. Now, most uh, economists are now saying in the 2030s sometime. But there are a lot of economists who are actually flat out questioning whether they'll ever surpass the United States. And this is assuming that China's uh, official statistics are correct, by the way. Um, uh, is The thing is, is that they've got a, their, their population is either about to, on official figures, is about to officially start contracting. And their population is rapidly aging. Some analysts think that's already begun. Um, and unlike, say, Taiwan, where we have uh, 700,000 uh, uh, workers brought in from uh, countries in the region uh, to help bolster the labor supply force, China does not bring in foreigners in any significant degree. So it's a population that's going to start shrinking, rapidly aging, Structurally, the government has been uh, expanding the role of state-owned enterprises and clamping down politically on companies, which is strangling some of their best, for example, uh, their tech um, and online businesses uh, have been cracked down on. Um, and they're putting in political commissars, which is all very stifling uh, for some of their most successful businesses. Um, the political tides are turning. A lot of other countries have realized that putting so much of their supply chains in China is risky. So I think there's going to be, and there is continuing to be a shift in investment out away from China. Um, and then you, you've also got, um, you've right now we're seeing a meltdown in the property market, which could bring down the economy with it, possibly. We don't really know yet for sure, but that's between 25 and 30% of the economy. And it's also the major store of household wealth. And if the bottom totally falls out on this, it'll also bring down local governments. Debt, will, which is already extremely high in China, will skyrocket and things could come unglued. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen, but that, those are not the only risks to the Chinese economy. There are, there are quite a few. Now, I think that they will still continue to grow over the long term, um, but their long term growth rates where it used to be double digits or, you know, and it was 8% was their annual target. This year, it's 5.5. They won't even come close to making that this year. Um, and it looks like long term, they're in for a period of slow growth, much slower growth, um, still good by developed country standards, but I don't see that it's going to be as uh, as phenomenal as it once was. And then you've got the rise of countries like India. So there may be a period uh, through the mid-century where China dominates, uh, but I do believe that the, some economies to watch are um, India, if they can sort out the license Raj uh, and some other issues there. Uh, Nigeria has a, a massive young population. It's very entrepreneurial. Um, if they can deal with corruption issues there, I think they have tremendous potential. Um, Egypt is a powerhouse; it could be much bigger. So I, I do think that there's a lot of uh, you know other countries that I think also will grow, but I think India is the big one to watch. Dr. Also, Keating. Don't, yeah. Sorry, Donovan. You want to finish that thought? No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> okay, Dr. Keating. I know you started to share why you think that China will be a top of the top economy for the majority of the 21st century. Would you like to expand on that? The well, the and first, I I'd like to comment that I I, I disagree with Courtney uh, that China does have allies and it does have friends. I in my mind countries change their friends and their allies depending on how their national interest changes and their national needs change so china does have friends and allies they may not be friends and allies always and they may not have been in the past but if you look at europe or something like that you know france and germany have been enemies and friends and allies and 
So I, I, I don't see that it's that, you know, countries operate out of self-interest and they also have their ideologies. And it's always interesting to see whether the ideology trumps self-interest or self-interest trumps ideology. Uh, but going back then to China's economy, uh, the question I always felt needed to be examined and has never really been examined is that you look at the way the US ended the Cold War. They basically, you know, did not do business with Russia that much or the USSR. But you know, when that succeeded in breaking the USSR, in the process, they switched around and with China, they, in their self-interest, they realized, hey, we got a lot of cheap labor here and we can make a lot of profit if we engage with China and get our, you know, companies making things there. When I came to Taiwan, almost everything in the U.S. was made in Taiwan. Now, hardly anything in the U.S. is made in Taiwan. It's made in China. We engage China. There were reasons for it. There are reasons not for it. But the, uh, in a way, we helped build China's economy. So I, I want to put that in there as a factor that, uh, and now, you know, the chickens come home to roost that uh, for every action, there is a reaction. The, so uh, going back, yeah, like Courtney said, yeah, China had this double digit growth. Now, you know, how reliable was that? I'm not sure, but it certainly was much better than it is now. And China is facing a big problem with the fact that it had that one child policy and it is going to have a lot of families supporting grandparents and even great grandparents out of just single child families that that's going to be a big factor down the road and they've changed of course to now you can have three children i think it is but so looking at this, you know, from the economic standpoint, uh, and this is a factor, but it's, it's a factor that nations should be able to work together on. I, in one of my books, I promote what I call the shift from a global village to a global home. And when you look on Earth as a global home paradigm, it's a paradigm shift. You know, Marshall McLuhan made the shift in the 60s to a global village, which is kind of what a lot of businesses operate under. But really for survival, we have to look on it as a global home paradigm, which means we are all family. And that means we've got to learn to work together economically for the environment for everything else so uh i don't know how you would you know fit that back to your question but it's uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like what you're saying I, i'll have to look up that concept um i haven't heard that before but i, I gotta I do, get one of my books <laughs> yeah maybe i'll start there i want to uh, continue with the rapid fire section to something that both of you know a thing or two about and that's taiwan let's start with donovan this time the us should more clearly state its policy on taiwan to the world agree or disagree agree dr keating what was the question again the sure the the statement is the us should more clearly state its policy on taiwan to the world? <laughs> That's a real good question. Uh, I, uh, I, I think it should state it clearly, even if it says we're still undecided. <laughs> I and mean, I gotta I try and spell that out. Okay, two agrees there. Next one, in respect to sovereignty, Taiwan is to China as Ukraine is to Russia. 
Donovan? Partially agree. Okay. Dr. Keating, do you agree or disagree? I'll partially agree also on that one. There are a lot of factors involved there that differentiate. That's fair. That's fair. Next bullet. It is likely that the US and China will de-escalate tensions over Taiwan and avoid a hot war in the foreseeable future. Donovan, do you agree or disagree? <laughs> I hope so, uh, <laughs> but I disagree. I, okay, I disagree on the Chinese side. I, I think they're hmm. ramping up tensions intentionally. Hmm. Dr. Keating, do you agree or disagree? Okay, this is on all countries avoiding a, a hot war. Right. Uh, it's likely that they will de-escalate tensions, both parties, U.S. and China. Okay, yeah, a lot of things, you know, got to be taken. You remember the Hainan incident in 2001? You get some hotshot pilot that'll screw things up. But uh, overall, I, I lean more disagree because China is hegemonic. And I don't see that changing in the mm -hmm. near future. Next bullet. Taiwan is severely dependent on the USA, which has led to Taiwan being coerced by the US in the past. Donovan, do you agree or disagree? Depends on the historical timeline. Uh, I'm also, I have a problem with the word severely dependent. Um, uh, historically, I would say I agree. In recent history, I would say disagree. Got it. Dr. Keating? Okay, yeah, I, I'm going to kind of go with Courtney on that. But historically, again, the U.S., you know, we got almost separate Taiwan and the ROC history. <laughs> and kind of, yeah. yes, and yeah. So I'm kind of with Courtney on that, that historically, in a way, it did, but its own, you know, it could have really settled things on the San Francisco Peace Treaty and never did. So, well, I we're running close to the end of time. Um, this has been a fascinating mm, conversation. The whole world is about to end. <laughs> I know, I know. That's a tough end point. But I, I actually have a bonus question that is somewhat in response to I think what we're both thinking, Donovan. Um, and I would love to hear both of your takes briefly in in thirty to sixty seconds. Um, uh, it seems like your response to, is there a peaceful resolution to the current situation? Um, it seemed like the response was, we should ramp up military deterrence and interoperability between allies and the Pacific in order to avoid a confrontation, a hot war confrontation. In other words, make it so unattractive to Chinese leadership to invade Taiwan that they do not. Is there a diplomatic solution? Is there other things outside of ramping up military um, uh, methods uh, in order to avoid this hot war? Um, I'll start with you, Donovan. I, I, I mean, honestly, if, if I could think of one, I would love to offer it. The, the problem is fundamentally the Chinese Communist Party's power rests uh, rested uh, in the post Tiananmen massacre period on rapid economic growth a they opened up slowly some personal freedoms and gave people the sense that uh, China was moving in the right direction and uh, extreme nationalism and restoring the glory of China as a world power and to reunite the nation as they call it um and the thing is, the first two of those uh, under Xi Jinping, the economy has been slowing uh, fairly rapidly. Youth unemployment is skyrocketing. Um, so that's kind of out of the picture right now. Number two, but you know, maybe it'll come back. Maybe, maybe the economic growth will come back. Uh, on the second one, uh, he's un unleashed a wave of repression that is pretty much undone all the opening that uh, happened under his pre predecessors, um, including a massive surveillance state and credit scores. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's scary there now. Um, 
so that's out of the picture. So really all they're left with is nationalism. And that's really the big thing that is underpinning the Chinese Communist Party. Now, they are trying to, I notice, pivot to something new, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and that is to try and push a, a little bit more of socialist uh, I, I, ideas uh, in, this, in the sense of um, uh, putting in laws that, uh, that make it uh, better for workers and things like that. But they've tended to do it in, in ways that actually harm as many people as they help. Um, uh, very ham-fisted. Uh, we've only got 30, 60 seconds, but you can look into the whole cram school debacle and you kind of see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Dr. Keating, is there a diplomatic, diplomatic path to avoiding the hot war? I don't see much of a diplomatic way, to be honest with you. I, I think it's really going to come down to, if you do this, we'll do that. And uh, you know, I, I don't see China being diplomatic. They, you know, they've dug a hole for themselves. They have to justify the CCP's existence. And to do that, they need to control and Therefore, they're not in the position to want to diplomatically deal with other people. Back when they wanted to get out of the situation that Mao put them in and Deng Xiaoping uh, was more amenable to a, a different economy, they were switching, you know, with a, whether it's a black cat or a white cat, whether it gets the mouse, that's okay. The, uh, so... I don't see a diplomatic situation. No, I, there, I don't see it at all. Some um, news that, or some information that uh, people don't necessarily want to hear, um, but it's important that we hear your perspective and your opinions. Thank you for sharing. And uh, let's go ahead and wrap up the program. Thank you listeners, AKA marchers. I appreciate the encouragement, feedback and questions. Please consider rating the podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. Guest panelists, Dr. Keating, Courtney Donovan-Smith, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for making time out of your busy schedules and contributing to our guest, excuse me, a grassroots podcast. Dr. Keating, I would love uh, for you to share a quick plug. To share? Sure, uh, I, I would love for you to have 60 seconds to just share your thoughts, generally speaking, if there's a question you'd like to expand on or a book you'd like to highlight, whatever you'd like to share with the audience, the floor is yours. Okay, well, uh, most of my thoughts are, I've got a website, Jerome F. Keating's Writings, and it has my books and op-eds that I've written over the past 20 years. Uh, but I'd actually like to push a little what I told in the Paradigm book that I wrote that what you were interested in, that we've got to go from a global village to a global home. That is a big paradigm shift, but it's necessary for the human race. And it's idealistic, but you know, that's what survival is the, uh, on planet Earth. The, uh, so I don't know, that gives you a closing line, but it is uh, in my mind, uh, you know, something i'll send you a copy maybe I, I love that concept of a global home and that's actually one of the conclusions that we had from the first season of the march was we should think of ourselves as one people that was a reoccurring theme thank you dr keating donovan the floor is yours um yeah just quickly uh, you can find um the articles that i write um on report.tw which is pretty short um we do, you can also see uh, my uh, podcasts uh, that me and others have done there. Um, I also uh, highlight some uh, interesting articles that I come across as well on there. Um, so there's a fair bit of, of content there if you, if you want to learn more. Um, and, uh, you know, for uh, Jerome's concept of a, of a global home, I really would love to see that happen. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are countries like China that are ethno-nationalist. Um, they identify themselves on their ethnicity, which is a big barrier to see to making that happen. 
but hopefully more people around the world will will you know look at the world that way and hopefully that'll seep into china i hope so too thank you uh both of you again for your time and your talents we'll be back uh, with hey, another i'd like to say courtney i like that mustache i think you should keep it <laughs> you heard it <laughs> well, here thank first, you marchers Come and tune in on YouTube to check out Courtney's uh, mustache. It is a thumbs up from Dr. Keating. <laughs> Until then, thanks everyone.